You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, welcome to the Choose FI podcast. Today we have an extremely special episode that we are thrilled to present. And I should take one step back and just set this up. We got an email from Matt basically saying, guys, I love the content that you've been producing and I think it's time you take it to the next level. There's a few conversations you just have to have. One of them would be essentially the state of the union for the FI community. What if you could get this elder FI statesman, someone that really has this amazing grasp on all the content that we've been struggling with and adopting into our own lives, but also could bridge that gap to maybe the traditional personal finance community and even the hedge fund community. What if you could find an individual to help you pick apart the problems with FI and then rebuild it on the backside? That is a conversation that we wanted to have, and there was only one obvious choice to have this conversation conversation and it's Todd Tresseter. So we went and we got the financial mentor. He's on the show today and we're going to be breaking down the FI community into its smallest rebuildable parts. And without any further ado, Todd Tresseter, financial mentor. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. So first of all, big, big shout out to Matt. Thanks for even uh, leading me in that way. I'm honored. Um, you know, I know all these guys. I mean, Pete over at Mr. Money Mustache, Brandon at uh, Mad Scientist. I mean, all these guys are great. So to sit there and tee me up that way is quite a compliment. Thank you. Well, we're thrilled that you're on the show. I mean, Brad has been raving about you for months and months, and we have been trying to make this happen. Honestly, we wanted to make this happen back in August, so it only took us an extra three or four months, but I think it's going to be worth the wait. Yeah, and Todd, welcome. It was uh, fun to meet you a couple years back. I think uh, my lasting memory is actually getting walloped by Brandon from the Mad Scientist at Ping Pong. That's what uh, we were sitting there at FinCon, and I didn't realize he was such a ringer. But yeah, he uh, definitely put the smack down on me, and I think he beat you as well, right? Yeah. Was, were you his victim before me or after I, me? I think I was right before you. No, he, he was nailing that Ping Pong. I think we've got to pick a, a real sporting event like bowling or something to really test it skills. That's the one nice. you went with for real sport bowling? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Obviously, none of, them, <laughs> none, of, none of them are real sports, right? But uh, we had we had a lot of fun over beers. It was a good time. Indeed. So what do you think about this idea, Todd? I mean, this idea of breaking down FI, taking a look at it, essentially the state of the union uh, of the FI community. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I'm fine with it. I think he pulled me out of the woodwork because I do have some some specific thoughts on it, and I've published on it. So that's probably where he was coming from when he said, get me in here. First of all, there's absolutely nothing wrong with how financial independence is traditionally taught. And particularly within, when you say FI community, I think of it as FIRE, right? Financial independence, retire early community. And there's a type of blog that dominates that where it really was headed out. I mean, Pete over at Mr. Money Mustache and Brandon kind of launched the whole thing. And there was a prototype and then all their followers started launching their own blogs, right? And so you ended up with this multiplication of pretty much one line of thinking, which was let's get our expenses down as low as we can get them. And then what that does is that lowers because your uh, financial independence is a multiple of how much you spend. I mean, the math is just the math. So let's back up a second. Um, the math of financial independence is governed by two equations. You've got the mathematical expectancy equation and you've got the future value equation, right? And so the mathematical expectancy equation determines the compound growth that goes inside the future value equation. Future value equation adds the dimensions of time and so on. And so you've got these two equations that run it regardless of how you look at it, right? Is that fair enough? You have me to this point. Absolutely. Okay. So then what the traditional FI standpoint does is they say, okay, let's take expenses down as low as we can because financial independence is a multiple of expenses that lowers the total amount of savings and that allows you to retire early. So as long as you can find happiness down at that lower level of savings, then you can retire early, right? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. They are 100% correct. Usually accompanying that is the idea of a low-cost passive index portfolio, right? So traditional asset allocation and paper assets as your investment choice with a low-cost passive index portfolio. That's usually another component that you see virtually universal. 
And then I think that's about it. I might be missing something. Oh, and the other thing that usually goes with it is what I'll call a stoic uh, philosophy, right? So you, in order to find happiness on less, it pretty much has to accompany a viewpoint on life that's uh, best represented by stoicism. And so you kind of get those components, you throw them together, and you've got pretty much what makes up all the fire blogs out there. Often they'll wrap them in with a little bit of travel too, since adventure and travel is often a motivating factor for, for financial independence. Is that a fair representation or am I off base? What do you guys think? I think that's pretty spot on from our perspective for a real high level intro to FI, essentially, like you're saying is evidenced on many of the popular blogs. Yeah. So, and again, there's nothing wrong with it. They are 100% correct. I'm not making anyone wrong here. What I'm saying though, is there's more to it. Okay, you can take another dimension to it. So what some people have started dubbing me is fat fire, right? So if you take what most people review, view financial independence as it would be lean fire, right? Lean fire being get your spending way down. And the way I've taken is I've, I've I come from a no right wrong position. So just as I was really carefully pointing out, these guys aren't wrong, right? That was their approach to it and it worked for them. And they're, they're respecting the math of how financial independence works. They absolutely aren't wrong, but there's more dimensions to it. You can build it the way it fits for your life. So for example, you know, I was telling Pete when I, when I first met him, I was telling him, geez, Pete, I mean, do you really live on 20 something grand a year? I mean, it was just amazing to me, right? Cause I was looking at going, well, between piano and dance lessons and private school for my kids, I think I spend more on just my kids' education than he was spending to support his entire family, <laughs> you know? And, and I was like, wow, I mean, it's just fascinating. I wish I, I wish I could find happiness at that level. I really wish I was Pete in that way because life would be so much easier, right? But I'm not. Mm. I'm not. I don't, find, I don't like to live life from the left side of the menu, and I don't like to relentlessly optimize my life to minimize my spending. In my viewpoint, a lot of people that pursue that line of thinking spend as much effort figuring out how to save money as they would just to earn it in the first place. And that being bound to the restrictions of having to save money is antithetical in my experience to what is really freedom. Um, and again, I'm not making anybody wrong. What I'm saying is there's different value systems here. I'm simply not as advanced as Pete in terms of his stoic viewpoints. I'm not. I like nice things. I like to take a vacation where everything isn't optimized in terms of cost structure. Sometimes I like to go to a nice restaurant. Sometimes I like to go to less expensive restaurants. Sometimes I don't want to eat out at all. I just don't want my choices decided by price. I want to choose things based on quality and based on the experience I'm choosing, not based on price. I don't want to relentlessly optimize my life. And so I kind of headed towards the thing of fat fire. The other thing I started figuring out was that, and by fat fire, I'm being cute with it, right? Just trying to play off lean fire versus fat fire and create cute little sayings. Uh, I guess it's the marketer in me, right? And so, <laughs> hey, you're good with fat fire. Just roll yeah. with it, man. No, no criticism right. there. <laughs> and yeah. actually, Todd, if I could just interject, what would do you have a definition of what fat fire is? As far as you know, generally, fi is 25 x. Like, do do you even do it on that level, or is this just more of a well, no, a but theoretical it's still the same thing. The math doesn't change. It just okay. changes how you work with the math. Interesting. Okay. okay. The math is inviolable, right? That's why I started out with giving you the two, you know, the few, it's mathematical expectancy. It's a future value equation. And so those multiples are pretty realistic, but they're realistic based on 4% rule. That's where the, that's where, uh, you know, 25 multiple comes from is it's the uh, reciprocal of the 4% rule. I mean, that's true for a uh, passive index traditional asset allocation portfolio and paper assets, right? But you can turn that all around if you go into real estate. And see, that's where I'm trying to go with this conversation. There's different spending levels you can go. There's different equity levels you can choose. And there's different asset classes and investment strategies you can choose. So again, and not to pick on Pete, because Pete is the best. I mean, I've met Pete, talked to him. He's 100% integrity. He walks the talk. He lives the talk. Nothing but compliments to him. I am not picking on Pete in any way with this. I'm using him because he's the, one of the top players. And so I'm using his with his examples. Okay. Um, so Pete, if you're listening, love you, baby. You know, there's absolutely no disrespect here at all. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. I'm respecting you by choosing you. And so one of the things that you can look at with Pete as an example of choosing different asset classes is, you know, Pete gained financial independence with traditional low cost passive index portfolio where he saved money, got his expenses down, saved a few hundred thousand bucks, and at 4% rule, he was financially independent. And so he's published all about that. There's no secret on it. But he's also published and disclosed that his blog makes 400 grand a year. 
that should give a little pause here. So here's a guy that's teaching you financial independence using traditional passive index portfolio, low cost structure, and yet in a couple years he built a blog that makes four hundred thousand. But he's now telling you about using the business asset class to achieve financial independence. Do you see the contradiction? That really is remarkable when you highlight it like that, isn't it, Brad? Yeah, it certainly is. I, I obviously, Todd, I see the contradiction, but I, I guess he would argue he reached financial independence prior. And I don't want to put words in. You're absolutely right. And that's why I said from the outset before I started this, Pete is 100% integrity. He yeah, walked the talk exactly as he teaches it. There is no there is no slight to Pete at all in this at all. I'm using him because he's one of the top guys. He's respected. He is integrity. And because of that, I'm pointing out a contradiction in the message that should be clear when you look at it. I mean, you're making a valuable point. One of the places that we've landed is helping the middle class essentially achieve a level of financial independence without crushing the income game, you know, without changing their, their job or their, their business structure, essentially taking the tools that they have available to them today and then getting themselves on a path to 10 or 15 years. But I feel like what you're highlighting is the fact that just because we showed how the math would work to accomplish that doesn't mean that's the only path. In fact, there may be another lane or several other lanes that we haven't spent enough time talking about which can open up the floodgates within a year or two. Absolutely. And you know that's intuitively true, right? We use Pete as an example to show it, but you can look at any 20-something millionaire. If you go interview 20-something millionaires and you say, how'd you attain that goal? And then they replied, well, you know, I, I made a bunch of money in my, jo- in my W-2 job and I turned it over to my financial planner who invested in low-cost passive index mutual funds with traditional asset allocation. It'd be a laughable joke. It's a laughable joke, right? The 20-something millionaires don't get there that way. They get there through business entrepreneurship asset class. You know, and the guys that are doing it in their 40s or 30s, and they work their way up, they traditionally do it through rental real estate. And so the way I teach financial independence is a little bit different. What I do is, first of all, I start out with you. You are the primary asset, okay? Um, And you know that's true because we all have the same investments we can choose from, right? Investments are generic. They're commodity items, So it doesn't matter what broker you go to or financial planner you go to. You can all choose from the same investments, but we're all going to get wildly different financial outcomes in life. And the difference is you, right? So that's your first asset that you develop is you. And then I go through and I point out that there's really two fundamentally different models that you're picking from to achieve financial independence. I do the traditional model, which is what you guys have studied probably ad nauseum and talked about on the show. And it's what traditional financial planning works with, which is, again, low-cost passive index portfolio is kind of the the current Vogue version of it. And so you take traditional financial planning and, you know, you make basically the model is you're supposed to go uh, make as much money as you can, spend as little as you can, scrimp and save and shove it all over to your portfolio. And then at the end of the rainbow, you're financially independent, wherever that's defined in time. And so, cause the magical asset allocation will get you there. And so that's kind of the traditional approach and it's fine. It's valid. It works, right? It's well-proven. It's well-documented. There's nothing wrong with it. Except if you don't cut the expenses way down as traditional FI teaches you to do, it will take you a lifetime to achieve it. The breakthrough for traditional FI is nothing more than saying don't spend your money. If you don't spend your money and you get your expenses under a certain structure, then what happens is all kinds of cool things, particularly for U.S. people, right? Because then they, you know, they get their income under a certain level and now they qualify for health care for free under Obamacare. You know, they pay little or no tax. You know, once you get your your life structured right, it doesn't take that much to live comfortably. And so they figured that out and they're absolutely right. Okay. But there's other asset classes that you can get there quicker. You can do it differently. And it's still the same math. It's still the mathematical expectancy equation. It's still the future value equation. That's inviolable. But you work with the math difference. So when you use business asset class and you use real estate, it works differently because For example, business asset class is unique in that you're not compounding from the equity side of the equation, okay? You literally, in the business asset class, you can create equity out of thin air, right? Because it's your time that you're doing it. So you're not stuck in a compounding equation. And so it works with the math very differently. So, and it has very different principles. See, another thing that if I never teaches, or I shouldn't say never teaches, I don't see it regularly talked about, I think is more accurate, is there's not a focus on risk management. But when you start understanding compound returns and the math of compound returns, um, risk management has to be a focus. So I'm kind of trailing a little bit. We got two trails we can go down here. You guys got to direct me. We got one which is 
risk management and how that plays into the math of this process, as well as using different asset classes. So you guys tell me where you want to take this. I don't think there's anything that you've said that I could strictly disagree with. What I'm very interested in is basically how to rebuild this or how to do a better job with this messaging. And so what I basically heard you say is the math works and it, what Pete did works. Stoicism works. Crushing your expenses work, but it's not the only way. And in fact, if you add a couple extra dimensions to this, it makes the messaging better. And it sounded to me like you're saying there's two things you think that the FI community could do better. One is talking about the two other asset classes that you don't feel like we spend enough time on. And that was the business asset class and the real estate asset class. And then the third component of that is the risk management. I think we should take a few minutes and talk about each of those. And honestly, the point of this conversation is that you kind of set the tone for the next several years on our show in terms of how we go about acquiring this information. So actually what I'm going to do is back up a second and give you one more level um, to add to the conversation. So I, what I, what I like to do is I like to explain that there's level one understanding and there's level two understanding. So let me explain the difference between level one and level two understanding. So level one understanding is what I'll call static. Um, it's generally a very simple, clearly structured answer that anybody can follow. And that's what gives it its universal appeal. That's why it goes popular. That's why people love it is it's plain and simple and easy to understand. So a great example of that in investing is buy and hold. Okay. Buy and hold. I mean, everything you need to know about buy and hold and low cost passive index al al asset allocation, you could fit in a paragraph and have room left over, right? You could put on one page and have room left over. It's so simple. And so for that reason, it's easy to sell. And what happens on level one or stand is it's close enough to the truth that it passes the smell test. But what we know about life is life is dynamic. There's, there's a more dynamic, more complex truth. It's nuanced. Truth is nuanced. And so that's the level two understanding. That's where I'm trying to take this conversation is to a level two understanding. So now what we're doing is we're introducing things like active risk management and the principles that plays out in the asset classes. We're introducing multiple asset classes. We're taking it to another level. Now that adds complexity, but what it does is it better represents reality. And that's what you were just sharing when you were asking me that is you're sharing how, yeah, you're nodding your head. You can see that what I'm saying is right, but yet the conversation hasn't gone there in the past. But when you hear it, it's obvious. It's like when I point out that Pete's making 400 grand a year with his website that he built in a couple years, but he spent years hit, hitting FI through traditional means, there's something interesting there. It doesn't make Pete wrong. It's just interesting. It's like, wait a minute. Here's another asset class. Here's another understanding of how to do this. And so that's where I want to take the conversation is level two understanding. It's dynamic. It's nuanced. And it better represents reality. That's the key. It's more complex. It's harder to wrap your head around. But the key point, it better represents reality. And therefore, you can be more successful with it. That's the key. And Todd, I definitely agree with that additional layer of complexity and, and understanding that life is dynamic. I think you said before, quote, you build it how it fits for your life. That's a crucial point is everyone's situation is different. And clearly, when we're talking on a podcast, generally, we're trying to give advice that will fit the most people, right? Because it's hard. You, we cannot dive into each individual scenario for every single one of our tens of thousands of listeners. So we're trying to give blanket advice, I guess, that that what's the most realistic and most likely for people to follow. And I think I think that's a crucial point. Like I've found in life that what separates successful people from unsuccessful ones is people who take action. And I think that's why that level one traditional you're close. five. You're, so you're right that it's action. Action is absolutely key. Nothing happens without action. But there's another piece that's not coming in the conversation that's key that fits right in, which is that every person brings to their FI game, everybody brings a different set of skills, resources, goals, timeframes. Okay. We're unique. And so a standard static formula isn't going to fit everyone. When you bring in the other asset classes, when you open it up and you stop making certain choices wrong and allow it to be open, then what happens is people can design their wealth plan to fit them. Okay. And that's the other key to succeeding. It's when you get a wealth plan that's properly designed, takes the specific characteristics of each of the three asset classes, because each asset class has different characteristics and you match them to the specific characteristics of your life as somebody who's pursuing FI. And that is your skills, your interest, your resources, your goals, your time frame. You start looking at those, you assess yourself and then you match it up and then it's the plan. The math is the math. But when you match the characters, it's like Velcro. When you get it right, those hooks and those loops mesh together and they hook well, and that's what creates success. When you get it wrong, you can try all you want. It doesn't work. I can't tell you how many people come to me and they talk about how they're sick of traditional FI. They don't fit the mold. 
And they're just excited to finally find the message where, hey, you know, now I can do it on my terms. This guy isn't making me wrong because I want to go out to dinner occasionally. Or I actually like working from Starbucks in the afternoon and I don't care that the coffee is a ripoff. There's so many people that just don't want to be made wrong and they don't have to be. If you're willing to pay the price of the trade-offs, it's okay. You just have to recognize that there's trade-offs for every decision you make. You just build that into your math and you decide what you want, what fits for your life. Does that make sense? It makes 100% sense. And and Todd, we we here at Choose of I don't tell anybody that they're wrong with any decision. It's it's what they value. And I think yeah. that's a term you, you know we use here as valuist. I'm not frugal, I'm not cheap. I'm a valuist. I might make decisions that Pete at Mr. Money Mustache might cringe at, but I've determined that that adds value in my life, and therefore that's a spending decision I'm willing to make a hundred times out of a hundred. So there's no, there's nothing doctrinaire here at Choose of Eyes. Certainly, it's it's what you value, and you need to assess that on each individual case, and and that's fine. You might decide that buying a BMW is something you value. Great, go for it. I totally agree with you. You have to make decisions that work for yourself. And I guess I'm that, curious. That's a so- key point because respecting your values is one key component of happiness. And the whole point of this is to be happy. Who gives a damn about the money, right? The money's just a means to an end. The whole point is you want to be happy. And the reason you pursue financial independence, most people do it off kind of a mistaken idea. Most people pursue financial independence because they have a high value on freedom. And so what they do is they project that internal experience of freedom or that value onto money. And then it becomes financial freedom. But what happens is when most people attain financial freedom, they realize that that was actually a mistake, that the real goal is freedom. And there's a much deeper experience of what freedom is. And that can include different spending decisions. And so that's why it's so key to really work with that idea of values and to build that into your wealth plans. Todd, you mentioned happiness and and what you value. I'd be curious here just personally, like what have you done to pursue happiness in your post-financial independence life? Well, the one thing that's been clear to me is it's experience is not stuff. And the other thing that's become clear to me is that I do like buying some conveniences. Um, I don't like mowing my lawn. I don't like maintaining the yard. I don't like maintaining the cars or uh, working on the house. I used to like building. So I used to like working on the house, but I don't anymore. So maybe it's just me getting old. I don't know. But (laughs) I like buying the convenience of some of this stuff. And I like having the money to do that and not have to worry about it. And frankly, it's more efficient. I can make more by building my business and working that and contribute more to people's lives through this education process I'm developing than I can by, by fixing something on my house. And so for me, it's all about experiences versus stuff. So I like to vacation. For me, the balance point is about three to four months a year is what I like to vacation. And then I like to work. When I work, I work very aggressively. And so I, I would probably be considered extremes. You know, like when I'm working, I'm working a lot, which is when the kids are in school. And then when we vacation, I literally don't even answer my phone. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you, are you plugged in at all on these vacations? You're totally offline. Pretty much, you know, so like sometimes I'll go camping where there's no reception at all, in which case I'm totally offline. Uh, like when I hike, I hike the John Muir Trail, which is 250 miles from the base of Yosemite to the peak of Mount Whitney going along the Sierra Pacific Range. Um and I was that was a 17-day trip, and most of that I had no reception. Um, you know, people were like, oh my God, what happened if your site crashed? And I'd be like, well, then my site crashed. You know, it didn't, but life isn't gonna end, you know, whereas that was a, a great trip. I'm so thankful I took it. When we did the Camino de Santiago, which was the whole family did that, that was five hundred miles across the top of Spain. We hiked across the top of Spain from France out to the coast. And that trip, uh, what I would do is I had my cell phone, but I didn't even get a foreign plan for my cell phone. Instead, what I did was I wouldn't check it at all during the day or anything. And we roll into the hotel and we'd been hiking all day. So I'd be tired. I'd have a beer. The kids would have an ice cream. And uh, I'd sit down. And at that point, almost always we had Wi-Fi. And I'd pull up the phone and I would just mass delete, you know, like just delete, 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 and delete everything. And then there'd be like, one or two that I couldn't just get rid of. And then I would leave those in about every four or five days. If we're in a hotel with good Wi-Fi, I would actually pull out my computer and clear a few emails by replying to them. So right. I'm, I might put an hour or two into every four or five days. 
sounds like a pretty unplugged vacation to me. That's fantastic. Can you tell tell us about that hike across Spain? I've I've heard about that before. So I'm assuming you said family. So uh, you have kids. Uh, how long was that trip? We've talked about like adventure travel, slow travel on the podcast. Like talk us talk us through that trip and and how that works with with an entire family. Well, we went two months to Europe. So we start out in Paris uh, just to kind of get over the jet lag and just get used to being out there. And so we spent, I think, what was it, 10 days or so in Paris and then spent about 30 days on the trail. It was almost mostly hiking, but we had mountain bikes for about four or five days. And it took about 30 days to accomplish it. We had several down days. There was about four or five down days. Like we were there right before the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And so they were setting up all the barricades and everything. So we, we had an extra day there and just kind of hung out. That was a really neat town. So there's four or five cities where we picked an extra day and just hung out. But generally, we were on the road hiking each day. We would hike anywhere. The, a short day would be 12 miles. A long day would be 22 or 24 miles. You know, over mountain passes and everything. Carried all our stuff in our backpacks. And then when we finished... Then we did a beach vacation, so we mixed it up. So we started with Parisian city life and then uh, a 30-day hike across Spain as like kind of an adventure trek trip and then uh, hung out at the beaches of, of Portugal afterwards. So we had a nice little beach hangout to relax after the long hike. So it was, it was two months on the road. It was really nice. You know, it sounds amazing. And it sounds like you have achieved a level of financial freedom. And I guess at this point in your life, I mean, working is optional. You're working for the passion of working, right? Well, I've been working optional since, well, I've, I, I mean, if you could see me, I'm 56, I'm gray haired. I've been working optional since age 35. And the reason I pointed that out is I wanted to come back to this concept of, you know, I think we've, we've done a great job of maybe highlighting the weak points of fire. But what I wanted to highlight is the life that you just described, that's a life of financial independence. It's still subject to the same math as the rest of us, but you chose different levers and you chose different asset classes. And, and I'd love to hear you highlight the difference in the characteristics of the asset classes that you chose. Yeah. So I think one of the unique things about my teaching is that I've done it in all three asset classes. So I've been successful in all three asset classes. I've also had tremendous mistakes in all three asset classes. So I started out in the hedge fund industry when I came out of college. So that was 1983, uh, ran a hedge fund until 1998 uh, when we sold it. And that was when I was quote unquote financially independent. And so, you know, that's where I learned a lot of the math around investment, how investment works, because we ran a quant fund, uh, which means that everything was quantitatively driven. It was all discipline math and statistical risk management models, uh, which we can go into a little bit, uh, but it really more connects to how you develop financial independence and in investing. And then when I transitioned out of that, I started buying large apartment buildings, not across the country, but in a few different states with the money from when I sold the hedge fund and then carried that until about the 2005, 2006, I started getting really uncomfortable with market conditions and credit bubble conditions in 2005, 2006. And so I committed, I didn't want any financial leverage at that point because financial leverage is the only type of leverage that cuts both ways. You know, it can kill you if you get it wrong and it can make you very wealthy when you get it right. And so I was carrying a lot of financial leverage on these apartment buildings. And I was just like, you know, this is a credit bubble. I'm not comfortable with it. And so I started selling and I had everything sold by the 2007 top. So the only thing I owned going into the real estate decline after being long real estate since 98 was my home, the home I live in. And so obviously then the collapse came in 2007 through 2009. And that's when I shifted towards uh, business asset class a second time, right? My first round in the business asset class was with uh, the hedge fund. And really, when you understand real estate, real estate is about half business, half investment. So it's kind of a hybrid asset class when you actively own your own real estate. And then I went back to the business asset class uh, to develop financial mentor, which I'd been playing with since 98. I actually started financial mentor in 98, but I never really took it seriously until kind of 2008 or so I started building it and taking it seriously. I had a vision for it of where I wanted to go once I discovered WordPress and then focused on paper assets to maintain liquidity. I haven't gone back to real estate since. So obviously I missed a huge rise in real estate after that. But again, my focus is always risk management, which we can talk about and why that's true. The, the rules apply to all of us. And 
I think what's so cool about the lane that you chose is instead of picking one, you had a foot and an arm in all three. And many of us just say, well, no, we're just going to stay over here. We're just going to do this one thing because this is our comfort zone. I think you're the first person that we brought on the show that can legitimately say that they didn't choose. They just did everything. And I think that's just an amazing perspective. Thanks. Yeah, there, there's a reason why, and that is has to do with risk reward, right? So the opportunity isn't great in every asset class at every point in time. So what happens is uh, risk-reward ratios vary at different points in time. So like when I got into paper assets back in 1983, I can remember I was going out to retirement plans for entrepreneurial companies where I would meet with the, the CEO, the CFO, and we were pitching them on our investment management services. And these guys would only touch, get this, right? It was Back then it was CDs because they were government guaranteed and they were paying in the teens in the 80s or I mean in the late 70s going into the 80s, they were paying in the teens, so they were government guaranteed. They were looking at me, and the stock market, the Dow, had kept bouncing off 1,000. And so they're looking at me going, well, the stock market's gone nowhere for over a decade, and I'm getting government guaranteed in the teens. Why would I mess with you? And it was a hard argument to beat, but of course that was the exact turning point. Whenever anything's obvious, it's pretty much over. And so, you know, as it turned out, I was exactly right. We went consecutive, all winning years, all the way to 98. As I explained, we had one actual loss to investors. It was a fraction of 1%. And that's because the fund made less than enough to cover all the management fees and expenses. So the investors lost a tiny fraction of 1% one year. But the fund itself actually made money every year. And that was, you know, the beginning point right there when everybody wouldn't even touch it. They wanted nothing to do with the stock market. And of course, that was one of the best times in history to ever invest in the stock market. Well, now you go fast forward to 97, 98, and I was looking at uh, one-day market risk and realizing I had a hard time managing one-day market risk, that volatility was picking up, the internet bubble was kicking in. You look at the final top, the NASDAQ was at over 200 times earnings for the entire index at the final top. That is insane. There is no possible way that that can make any economic sense at all. And of course it didn't, you know, and it subsequently fell, what, I don't even know, 70, 80, 90%, whatever the number was. And it it didn't come back for years afterwards. And so what you're seeing me do throughout my career is I'm opportunistically picking risk reward, uh, where the risk and reward makes the most sense. So now let's fast forward to real estate, right? What happened in real estate was I had been buying apartment buildings for, I don't know, about like 30 cents on the dollar of new construction costs. I was buying them out in Oklahoma, Kansas City, kind of Midwest area. And around 2006, people were willing to buy them off me for what I'd paid 18000 a door for. People were wanting to pay forty, forty-five thousand 45000 a door for. New construction back then was about 60000 a door. And so I knew that I'd probably get up to about 80% with C-class apartment buildings, but I wasn't going to get to the full cost of new construction. And so to me, they were paying full value. Uh, they were paying way more than I ever would have paid for them because I knew the building inside out. I owned it. And so I let them have it, you know, and I moved the money over. And what I was concerned about is I had tenants that didn't even qualify to rent a $600 apartment from me. And, you know, because I knew their credit history because they would apply for the apartment. They didn't even qualify to rent the apartment from me. And I was having to take them. And then they were leaving me because they get a $300,000 loan with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage for a house. And I was like, oh my God, if this isn't a bubble, I don't know what it is. These guys don't even qualify to rent a $600 a month apartment. And so that, I just said, you know, enough. I, I, I just didn't want the financial leverage. I could see it was a credit bubble. And the thing about real estate, real estate's a great wealth builder most of the time. And that's because inflation, ever since 1933, when we went off the gold standard and we already had the Federal Reserve Bank from 1914, I believe it was, Um, we had pretty much consistent inflation ever since with small bouts of deflation. And see, real estate is a leverage play on inflation. And so what happens is, though, it's also because it's leverage play on inflation. If you get credit deflation, it can be devastating your portfolio. And that's what we saw in the 2008-2009 decline, where the banking panic set in and you had credit deflation. And that destroyed real estate investors uh, because their leverage cuts both ways, as we talked about earlier. So I sidestepped that, you know, I I cleared out because the risk didn't favor the reward. You know, it just didn't make sense. Assets were fully valued just like they were at the stock market top. They were fully valued at the the real estate top too. And the risk was clear. And so I'd exit the market. And so what you've seen me ever since is I've been working from the paper asset side to maintain liquidity as well as the business side, because again, I can manage the risk here very carefully. Let's set up a hypothetical. Uh, Todd, what do you say to the person that says life is literally a limited amount of time? And in that time, you only have so many you know, decisions that you get to make before that time runs out. 
and I can learn a small degree about each of these asset classes, but I don't have time to become a master of any of them. I guess you could find a team of people to do that for you, but that sounds expensive and somewhat risky in and of itself. I found an asset class, a paper asset class that will give me predictable rates of return and I'm, and I'm willing to sacrifice maybe a percentage of results and accept potentially a little bit more volatility while taking the remainder of my time and focusing it on the business and the real estate asset class. First of all, it's not a predictable rate of return. I mean, you can get drawdowns that are absolutely astounding. And here's the, okay, so let me, te- let me teach another point here that's not taught. This, this goes back to our state of the FI, right? Okay, so, and that is that with a paper asset portfolio, you've got to pretty much assume you're going to go through at least a 50% drawdown at some point. Now, let's go through and understand that the, comp, the, the math of compound returns is asymmetric. So a 50% drawdown requires 100% return to get back to even. That doesn't happen quickly. It takes years to develop a 50% drawdown. It takes years to get that 100% return to get back to even. So are all the traditional financial advisors correct that eventually the market will come back? Yes, Absolutely true. Okay. And there's a reason for that. That has to do with inflation's embedded rate of return inside of there, plus the growth of the economy. It all gets built in, and we can go into that later on. There's a math reason why it's true. Okay. So it is true. They're right. But here's the key point your portfolio won't. Okay. If you're living off your assets, which is the whole goal of becoming financially independent, right? You want to live off your assets. Let's just use the 4% rule. I'm not saying it's right. I wrote a whole book on it, right? Again, it's close enough to reality to use it as approximation, but there's a lot you got to understand about it. So let's just use it for fun for argument's sake. 4% rule, let's use the actual 2000 top, right? The actual 2000 top. So from 2000, what was it, till like 2012 or 2013 before the S&P got back to its old point? Do you guys remember the exact number? I don't. That sounds roughly right, but I can right, look it up on use, Google while you're talking. Yeah, let's just use 2012 for argument's sake, okay? So it's 12 years, right, before the S&P got back to even. So if you got the 4% rule and you're living off 4% of your portfolio, you're down 50% in your portfolio before you even adjust for volatility effects on the portfolio. And so let's just rough compound it. You're probably down more something like 50, 60%. So you do that twice in your lifetime in your toast. So the point being, when you live off your portfolio, the math of drawing down a portfolio is different than the math of compounding the portfolio and building it in the first place. They work different ways. And so you've got to understand that when you, when you develop your FI equations. And so, again, you know, I develop all this in the teachings over at the site, but there's periods where you're going to have much higher rates of return like we had from the, you know, the bull market in the 80s and 90s, which is what a lot of people think they're basing their conclusions on because that's where most of the data comes from is usually kind of 73 forward. And so it's got a lot of built-in bias. You've got a 35-year bull market, almost a 40-year bull market in bonds in there. You've got the greatest bull market in stocks in recorded history, where every decline was a deflationary decline, and therefore the Fed bailed it out with lower interest rates. We haven't had an inflationary decline built in that data. So there's times when stocks and bonds correlate to the downside, and you don't get the diversification value that you've seen in all the, in the last 40 years of data. So there's a lot more to understand this. It is not a predictable rate of return. There's periods where it's going to be higher. There's periods where it's going to be lower. But the key point is that you can go for over a decade without getting a positive return in your portfolio that's occurred mil- multiple times in history. And when you're living off your portfolio, that drawdown is huge because I'm not building in the inflation costs. I'm not building in all kinds of things. When we talk about the asymmetric returns of getting back to even, which is you know like a 10% loss equals an 11% return to get back to even, 25% equals a 33% return to get back to even, 50% equals 100% return to get back to even, those are just getting back to even. Okay. In real life, you've got inflation. In real life, you've got spending. In real life, you've got the portfolio expenses. In real life, you've got all kinds of other stuff in there. And so the math is really harsh on this stuff. Okay. It's, it's more complex than most people teach. Man, Todd, you're setting my hair on fire over here, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, but I'm, I'm just telling you, I mean, it's, it's obviously true as soon as I explain it that way, isn't it? Yeah, Todd, for sure. You know, it comes to mind when we're talking about this, this volatility, usually that extreme volatility would be associated with being 100% in equities, right? 
That's not true because you could have stocks and bonds correlate to the downside. You just haven't seen it in the data you're looking at. Where you get stocks and bonds correlating to the downside is when you have inflation as a problem because then the Fed can't turn around and bail it out with lower interest rates, which is the kind of de facto thing that everybody just assumes is always true. Okay, so here's a fun little side nugget. Okay, this is not related to our conversation, but you want to, but it's a fun side nugget, a little little uh, gem here to leave for people is as an investor, you always want to look for the obvious thing that nobody's looking at. And so we're recording this in 2017 right now, right? October 2017. And the thing nobody's looking at is inflation. If inflation comes back, everybody's just assuming it's dead. Inflation's gone. When inflation comes back, all rules change. All rules will change in how the Fed can manage the problem, what responses will occur, and whether or not the market could go down and stay down. Because see, another thing that's not commonly understood is equities do worse in inflationary environments, which is counterintuitive to what most people think, as well as bonds do poorly. That's where you get the correlation to the downside. Not only that, the government response isn't quite as cookie cutter because they can't just lower interest rates in an inflationary environment. And so that could be a game changer. You always want to look for that thing that is obvious and could be there, but nobody's looking at. So for example, I did that back in uh, 2005, 2006. If you recall back then, you guys are old enough to remember this. Back then, people used to believe real estate never went down. Do you you remember that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was actually a truth. Like, people believed it was true. Nobody believes it now. It sounds laughable. But back then, it was a truth. When I was selling my real estate, I was openly criticized. I was told that I was stupid. Literally, I was told I was stupid to pay the taxes on those gains. Now, in hindsight, it was obviously smart, right? It's hard to do. It's hard to be out of sync when everybody believes one thing. So what is the universal truth right now? As we record this, the universal truth is the belief in low-cost passive index buy and hold is the one answer to paper asset investing, and that the other universal truth is that every decline in the market will be met by the Fed put, right? The government will bail out every decline, and you'll march on to new higher highs. That's the universal truth, so watch out for it. All right, I'll keep sticking my face in front of the fire here, Brad, unless you want to hop in. Feel free. <laughs> no, I, w- I was just going to say, so, I mean, we're talking about the state and future of, of FI. And Todd, you've described <clears throat> two of these exits. So you called the, the NASDAQ, the high of the NASDAQ and the real estate bubble. What do you see in the future? I mean, do you see that issue coming where the Fed doesn't, Great doesn't bail Great. things out? No, Great point. I don't predict the future. All I do is manage risk and it takes care of it for me. If you look at everything I've done, I've never once predicted the future. I've just left unfavorable risk reward ratios on the table. And so sometimes it doesn't work in your favor. So just to be totally fair, look at how I missed the real estate rise from 2009 bottom to current. That's an epic rise, man. That was huge. People made fortunes off it. I completely missed it. Why? Risk management, okay? I wasn't willing to make a bet that those government bailouts were actually going to turn that market on a dime the way it did and that you get the kind of move you did. Now, in my opinion, they only kicked the can down the road. I don't think anything's fundamentally been solved. But that road went a lot longer than I ever expected. As a matter of fact, it went long enough that we get to call me wrong. Okay, I was just wrong, okay? And so, but I'm okay with that because see what happens is when you focus on risk management and you're wrong, all that happens is you left opportunity on the table. It doesn't mean that you fail because there's other markets, right? There's other markets to invest in. I didn't have to be in the real estate market. Okay. So let's go to unique, I'll tie this in with unique characteristics. The unique characteristic of real estate is it's illiquid. Okay. It, there's two reasons for that, okay? There's a mathematically optimum transaction frequency that's determined by volatility and transaction costs in a market. And so real estate is historically a low volatility asset with a high transaction cost. And therefore, the optimal holding period is relatively long in real estate. Now, you can do fix and flips. You can do other stuff. There's ways around it, but it's just kind of a characteristic. And so the thing about real estate, and it's kind of a joke in the real estate market, is that it ne- real estate never goes down. It just goes illiquid, right? That's kind of a joke in real estate. Well, it actually does go down, and when it goes down, you can't sell it. And so all your risk management in real estate has to occur up front when you either choose to accept the deal and how you structure the deal. And so I couldn't figure out a way, once, once I could no longer do uh, conduit financing on large properties, because when the credit bubble burst, all the different, all the different credit policies changed, right? different ways of financing property changed. And I could no longer do conduit financing where I was basically, 
I was no longer on the hook for the building. I could just turn the building in if I wanted to. And so different forms of risk management, I was going to have to basically accept the entire risk of downside of owning a property. And I wasn't willing to take that risk. So that's why I've chosen to remain liquid. I want to remain flexible because first of all, I can't call where this economy is going to go to answer your question because you know there's really smart people that can make a great deflationary case. I mean, basically there's no, there's no recorded point in history where a credit bubble has been resolved without first deflating and destroying the bad credit. And that's essentially what the government's trying to do. They're trying to kick the can down the road, take the bad credit over, help the banks re- recapitalize, all these different things that are trying to get the bad credit to be dealt with in some way without actually letting it just go bad. And so they're trying to do that desperately, and they're trying to reflate, and yet they can't seem to get the reflation. That's because all the bad debt's still around and the economy's still totally leveraged. And so this thing runs on a knife edge of stability, I mean, you can make a really smart case for it going into a major inflation, and you can make a really smart case for it going into a deflation. If you ask me for my opinion, I think we're going to get both. I think I think we're going to see kind of the worst of both worlds at some point. And so my only prediction is volatility, which, of course, is the direct opposite of what we have now. We have the lowest volatility, the lowest VIX as of this recording. It's lowest VIX in history. Um, I think it's going to move to volatility at some point. But again, I don't make predictions off of that. I should say I make the prediction, but I don't put any money on it. What I do is I remove money based on it. I choose where not to be where I can see unfavorable risk, but I can't actually place based on a prediction because one of the tenets of what I teach when I teach this stuff is that uh, the future is unknowable. And so the essence of investment success is you put capital at risk into an unknowable future. And so you have to ask yourself, how do you do that? You know, and that gets into really interesting stuff around investing. And Todd, your risk management reminds me of, of what Warren Buffett says with his rules of investing, which is rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. And I don't know if, if you agree or disagree with, with what Mr. Buffett has to say, but that, that just was very reminiscent of it for me. And, yeah, well, Warren's <laughs> Warren's way smarter than me. I mean, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to disagree with him. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it's the exact same message, just said with different words. And it, it, you know, who cares what Warren or Todd says? Okay, uh, there's a math reason why it's true. It has to do with the asymmetric returns. It has to do with the way uh, wealth compounds. And so there's a math reason why it's absolutely true. And if you look, it's interesting. Like in in the course where I teach this stuff. There's a whole section of quotes I do from famous hedge fund managers, the guys that have the best track records in the industry, and every one of them emphasizes risk management as a primary discipline. Now, take that and compare that to traditional low-cost passive index asset allocation or compare that to how most people talk about investing. I'm saying that it has to be the first word out of your mouth, risk management. If you notice in this interview, it's been the first word out of my mouth every time. And you look at the tracker of the most successful investors in the business. It's, it's what they talk about. It's not what most people talk about, though. So, Todd, I mean, ultimately, I guess the funnel that I'm trying to move us towards is when would it be appropriate to consider low-cost passive investing in index funds? When it fits your personal characteristics. Let me give an example. Let's say that you're a really highly compensated attorney and you're making, I don't know, several, several hundred thousand a year, right? And you love your career. You're very happy with it. And so maybe what you do for your wealth plan is rather than pay rent on the building where your attorney practice is, you go ahead and you buy the real estate that your attorney practices and that'd be your real estate position. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? Any accountant where the salt will say that if you've got a business time horizon of 10 or pretty much uh, about 15, 20 years, that it almost always makes sense to own rather than rent. So, And then it's, it's very low risk because you control both sides of the equation. So as long as you're in business, you know you're going to pay enough rent to positive cash flow on the property. You may as well own it. And so you might have that in your wealth plan. And then the rest you just use to maximize your uh, retirement plans. And you max them out and you shovel it over. And rather than become an investment expert, if you plan on being in your career for 20, 30 years, you're happy with it, then go ahead and shovel it in the passive index funds. It's going to work great. Why, why make life more complicated? That fits your situation. Now let's contrast that though with the uh, 30-year-old school teacher who's making enough to live, but not a lot more. It's, it's really difficult for that person to save substantially, and it's going to take them an entire lifetime to do that. And maybe they want FI in 10 years because they love to travel and they want to do something other than teach. And so maybe it might make sense because their characteristics are different. They have summers off. Maybe this individual is very good and actually enjoys working with their hands and doing repairs. So maybe they do one house a year. 
right? They focus on one house a year. They find an investor who'll put up the down payment so they don't have to worry about saving the money. They find the one deal they want to work on. They fix it up each summer. They keep it for long-term rental. They share the profits. And in a few years, they can be financially independent that way. Because as a school teacher, they never never developed a huge spending habit. So it's not going to take that many properties. That plan will work for that individual, but it, it won't be smart for the lawyer, right? Because why does he want to sit there and be fixing up houses? His His best value for his time, this source of wealth is his legal practice. There's several things you got to do in wealth building. You've got to identify the source of wealth. That's something everybody skips over, right? But that's integral to developing the plan properly. Again, I teach all this in this course, right? We're just grabbing fragments of it, but it's, you know, you got to get these components right in order to fit the plan right to your life situation. So to answer your question, low cost passive index asset allocation can work perfectly when it fits your plan, your life situation. It just happens that a lot of people it doesn't, but they're using it anyway because it's the only answer they know. So Todd, what I love about that is we've covered investing. Uh, I've gotten my haircut and we've also talked about real estate. The one path that we haven't really talked about is, is the business. Could you take just a couple minutes and talk about the unique characteristics of the business asset class? Yeah, yeah. Business has some fascinating characteristics, right? Because as I said earlier, it's the only asset class where you're not actually compounding from equity, right? So like in paper assets, you have to throw a certain amount of equity at it and your compound rate of growth is based on that equity. You're compounding on the equity. And similar in real estate, you can get around it by using investor financing and you can do some other stuff where you can get around the the equity. But see, that's the rules that govern the compound return. But in, in business, it's not true. In business, you're literally creating equity out of thin air. And so there's a unique characteristic in business that you don't find in any other asset class, which is you could fail 100 times in a row. But if you're an excellent risk manager and you know how to use lean startup principles and product development principles to keep your risk down low when you're first uh, beta testing it and really figuring out if you've got a viable business model, you could go through 100 failures. And if you get the 101th business right and know how to leverage it up and know how to multiply it, you can be a, a huge success. So it's unique characteristic of business is you can fail 99 times and on the 100th time you can be financially independent or you can get it right the first time. There's no compound return equation involved. And and so that frees you up. So for example, let's apply that to a 50-year-old listener right now who has never been a great saver. He knows he's getting older. He doesn't doesn't want to sit there and start saving and scrimping and saving and go the traditional FI route. He knows he's behind the eight ball business asset class opens the door. He can achieve financial independence in just a few short years. And this is not some big stretch. It's not some pie in the sky thing. It happens all the time. And the other interesting thing about business asset class is you can take it, build it up, and then you can convert it to a cash flow stream. There's various strategies around that. And so business asset class frees you from those compound return equations that govern the other two asset classes. It's completely unique and it fits specific life situations. Again, it goes back to what I'm saying. You've got to understand the characteristics of the asset classes and tie them back. And so that also ties back to risk management. We talked about risk management on real estate and how the biggest risk factor in real estate is owning, being leveraged in real estate in front of a credit bubble bursting, in front of a banking panic, that type of thing, deflationary bubbles. And so, you know, that's a risk characteristic unique to real estate. In business, it's unique because you can get your risk down to where literally the way I manage risk so tightly in business, when I fail, I usually still profit. You know, you can get it down to that level with the business asset class. And then with paper assets, though, it's very limited. You can't do those things, right? There's different risk management principles that you apply to paper asset classes. So what I like to say is I'm very careful with paper assets for one reason, volatility. I'm very careful with business because of my time. Okay, business chews up my time. Paper assets have volatility. I'm very careful with real estate because of illiquidity combined with deflationary bubbles. I don't want to be illiquid and leveraged in front of a deflationary collapse. And so if I see that risk, I'm not touching it because I don't have to have it. And so each asset has its own characteristics. You've got to tie them together and the wealth plan is going to work for your life. Yeah, that's that's incredible stuff, Todd. And I, I'm curious how someone determines what the best path is for them. Let's say let's say someone is just finding five for the first time. They're not terribly f- sophisticated as far as finances go. Like, 
how did they determine which of these asset classes is the best for them? Like, how do they even get started, Todd? Yeah. So, I mean, you're giving me a perfect layup to pitch my course. I mean, basically that's exactly what I do with the course, right? In the, in the course, and the whole reason I built it is for this conversation, right? I mean, we've touched on so many of these things, but we haven't really covered in a way that's actionable because we can't. In 45 minutes, you can't do it, right? But we've covered what we can in the time we had. And so in the course, I go through all this in excruciating detail, step by step. I build all the logic brick by brick. Rick, and it starts with you, then it goes through the traditional model, and then it goes through the advanced planning framework, and then you develop the plan, then you take the plan and you convert it back down to action steps. You reverse engineer it back to actionable steps, and then you take and you build a correct and adjust mechanism in the plan. And so it's a totally different approach to wealth planning than you know is traditionally taught or even taught within the FI community. And again, it's all in the course, soup to nuts. Todd, that's the most compelling case I've ever heard for a financial mentor in my life. So just to our audience, if that appealed to you and you're interested in that, I'm going to set up a short link for you guys. If you want to go check out Todd's uh, class that he offers, the link is going to be choosefi.com slash mentor. Todd, thank you so much for honestly, I mean, you say this wasn't actionable, but I contest that. It was incredibly actionable. I'm shocked at how deep you went into this content and it was a reframing. And you know, I took a little bit of a haircut on this one. I, I love that you called me out, maybe for my own limiting beliefs in some cases, but I think you did more than that. I think you you may have burned the barn down, but I think you helped us rebuild it and you helped us show where we need to work further on developing this message. And so for that, I mean, Brad and I are both grateful and I think our community will benefit from this as well. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I love this stuff. I'm a nut for it. You know, I mean, I've I've been fascinated by the wealth building game. It's had a huge positive impact on my life. And this is my give back. You know, I'm creating this business. It's, I mean, anybody that's done this stuff, it's ridiculously hard work to build these courses. So to do it right takes a lot of work, but it's, it's super rewarding too. The response of the students has been beyond my expectations. And so that's why I'm really, really happy about it and enjoying building it. What's the best way for people to reach you? Well, it's financialmentor.com. You know, for people that enjoyed the interview, they got value, they should just come over to the site. Uh, I give away some free bonuses when they subscribe. I give away a free ebook, 18 Essential Lessons of a Self-Made Millionaire. Covers a lot of stuff we didn't even touch on in this interview. Uh, it's free, you know, so you can read it and see if you resonate with it. Um, there's a free course, 52 Weeks to Financial Freedom. No, you won't get rich in 52 weeks, but it'll give you the framework of the what I call the seven steps to seven figures. I have a, a process that I teach called seven steps to seven figures. Again, you know, all all this is on the website. Most of it's free. There's only a few things you got to pay for. I got some books on Amazon you got to pay for. I've got uh, the courses that you have to pay for. Uh, but you know, I've got the largest collection of financial calculators on the internet short of the guys that sell them. Uh, and they're all free. So again, just tons of free resources, financialmentor.com. Come on over and enjoy it. And if you resonate with it, then you can take the next step. All right. Well, normally that would be the end of this interview, but on this podcast, we'd like to offer you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Have you heard our hot seat yet? I'm, I'm flying blind, dude. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. My buns are burning. Let's go. <laughs> All right, Todd. Question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. Okay, so I'm actually kind of funny because... I don't think that way. So like I have favorite blogs, but they cycle through all the time, right? So like when I was really into copywriting and learning copywriting, I was really into a uh, copy blogger. When I was first learning about internet marketing and starting to develop understanding the website, I was really into smart passive income. So my favorite site cycles with whatever I'm focused on learning. I generally tend to deep dive to grab that level two understanding we talked about earlier. Once I get it, I pretty much ignore after that. So I don't really have a favorite. I, it just depends on what I'm trying to learn at the time. So the obvious follow-up is what are you trying to learn now? What in the last year have you dove deep into? Ah, another interesting question. Nothing. Here's the interesting reason why is at least interesting to me, right? It's my life. I find it interesting <laughs> um, is because I'm putting out, I'm not taking in. So there's a rule when you're taking in, you can't put out. And so I'm creating the courses we talked about earlier. I'm creating this stuff. I'm trying to build up the site. And so I can't produce if I'm doing nothing but gather information. And so my focus has been putting out, not taking in. 
It's interesting. That's a theme I've heard before. It's one to a, a varying degree that I can identify with. But I, I know you're in the past, you've been a rabid consumer of knowledge from books and from blogs, I would imagine, as you're Oh indicating. my gosh. Yeah, yeah, huge. I mean, I'm an avid reader. Don't don't take this to mean I don't run around and learn. I learn when I have to gather to get to a level two understanding until I know it. Once I know it, I take action. And so what you're seeing me right now is I'm in a prolonged action phase where I know what I need to do. I know how to do it. And the projects are so large that it's the, the action phase is running over a period of years. And so that's just the nature of where I'm at. I know what I need to do. I'm just doing it. Todd, in this prolonged period of action, right? Are, are you still reading for pleasure? Like, are you reading fiction, nonfiction, or are you just consuming nothing? No, no, no. Um, if I'm on a trip, like if we travel or something, I'll read some stuff. Um, but okay. So here's an example. So my daughter's getting ready for college, right? And I actually did an interview for my podcast about college financing with a different couple of different college financing experts. And so I read a couple books in advance of that. So that would be an example, but yeah, I'm basically consuming very little compared to what I used to. I used to spend, you know, hours a day consuming info, and I'm not doing that right now because I can't produce. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. Now, this can be one that you wrote or somebody else's. Again, I'm sorry. I'm just not an absolutist. I don't have a favorite of all time that just even comes to mind. Like on my site, you know, I, I really like the one about happiness isn't about money. Another one was how anyone can retire in 10 years or less, but they're about different subjects. One is about fulfillment and freedom and leading a free life, even if you're not financially independent. The other one was like really boiling down the whole FI game into a single article. You know, like this is the math. This is how it works. This is what it is. It's straight and simple. Bam, done. One article. So I like them for different reasons, but do I have a favorite? No, I, I don't. I just don't think that way. Well, you may not be an absolutist, but I would say you are a contrarian. And in that regards, you're right at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? I am absolutely a contrarian. Like it's part of my nature. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Todd. So I will adapt our question number three, since you're not an absolutist. Normally it's what's your favorite life hack, but do you have any life hacks that you've found especially valuable that have maybe saved time or energy or made you more efficient or, or just anything, any type of life hack you could pass on to the audience? I don't know if this qualifies as a life hack, but the thing that immediately comes to mind when you ask me this is exercise. So I go for long distance runs or cycling every other day. And so what that does is that keeps me centered, grounded, as well as healthy, right? As I age, that becomes even more important. And so I don't know if that qualifies as a life hack, but I can't imagine life without it. That certainly works as a life hack for me. I, I'm curious, do you have anything else that you do for your mind and body to, to keep them in tip-top shape other than you, cycling and running? Well, I have to give a hat tip to my wife. I mean, she only fills the house with healthy food. She prepares healthy food. I'm very fortunate that way. Um, so the combination of her sourcing local food and organic food and seasonally appropriate food and how she builds our, our diet. She's taking care of that whole side of the equation. All I have to do is the exercise part and uh, it takes care of our health. All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. Selling the business, selling the hedge fund business. You get an absolute one on that. Nothing comes close. I, uh, that was a multi-million dollar error. So to bring it full circle, we had a hedge fund that I could have had you know, the other part owner was willing to just give it to me and I didn't want it. I wanted to move on with life. I really wanted to travel. I'd, you know, I'd work straight out of college. You got just to back up. I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I committed to financial independence when I came out of college. So basically then, you know, built the hedge fund with this one guy. And when he got tired of it, I got tired of it about the same time. And I really wanted to travel. I'd always wanted to just kind of backpack around Europe with, you know, nothing more than a backpack on. So I married my girlfriend at the time, who's now still my wife. We traveled around Europe and stuff. In order to do that, I sold the hedge fund, which was just stupid because I easily could have converted that into a cash flow machine that I probably still would have today. And that one decision has cost me many, many millions. But the, on the bright side, you said financial mistake. I want to be clear. It was a stupid, stupid financial mistake. But in terms of a life decision, it was brilliant because it took me down paths and put me in different paths that I wouldn't have gone if I'd maintained the hedge fund. And so from that regard, I'm thankful that I was stupid enough to do it because I think my life was better for it. But of course, we never get to know. I love that. I love that you highlighted the fact that it was a financial mistake, but not a life mistake. And I think that's a thread we've seen with other people. Those are not necessarily the same. Yeah, no, they're not at all. 
And Todd, the sale of the hedge fund was not a risk management issue at all. It was a purely a lifestyle play. Well, at the time we were uncomfortable with, you know, daily volatility and our ability to manage risk the way we had successfully done it for the years. Um, you know, the market was heading into uncharted territory. I mean, the previous high on the CAPE ratio, which was cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, uh, was, I think, t- what was it, 29 or something like or 30, no, 36 back in the Great Depression, before the Great Depression. I'm pulling numbers out of the top of my head, so don't hold me to them, but I think it was like 36. And we were heading above that. Um, and it was unprecedented territory. We only, you know, there was only a very small sample size of just historic, horrid bear markets that were subsequent to those types of valuation levels, uh, which coincidentally are the valuation levels we're in now as we record this. Um, but it's a who's who of the worst times to ever invest in the stock market. And so I was getting uncomfortable with running an investment management firm at the time. And I just really had, so it was a risk management a little bit. But it was really more driven by the fact that I just really wanted to get out and do something else, and I had enough money to afford to do it, so I just did it. You know, so it was kind of a little of both, but really it was more about life. You know, I know this would extend the interview, but I just wanted to highlight for our audience that your wealth was due to your savings rate, not the not the sell off of the hedge fund. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. So I was financially independent before we sold the hedge fund, and it was because I basically, I mean, you know, even though we we took Pete to task, again, I, I want to be clear, he's right. And one of the things that I did right was I never really raised my spending much about a college kid. Um, so I, you know, I started the hedge fund out of college, or started working as a partner in the hedge fund out of college, or shortly after college, I should say. And then I never really raised the lifestyle. I mean, I can still remember when my mom turned to me and she goes you're making all this money. Why don't you do something with it? Why don't you buy yourself a Corvette, get a boat? And I was just like, I don't want those things. Like that, that's not true. I love playing volleyball on the beach with my friends. I love mountain biking. Those things don't cost money. You know, like I didn't want the inconvenience of all the toys and the expense and stuff. So, I mean, I really do have some level of those values, which drove the savings rate. I mean, at the, when, you know, when I was making good money in the hedge fund, I was saving 70% plus of everything I made, which is, you know, if you go into that post, how anyone can retire in 10 years or less. I mean, I point out that's how I did it. You know, I saved my way to wealth. I know you understand the math. I mean, you, you obviously understand it and could explain it to me at a way deeper level than I ever could. And so I'm curious your thoughts on, we, we've mentioned the 4% rule, your thoughts on that safe withdrawal rule. How does someone that is so aware of how to manage the risk, how do you tackle a problem like the 4% rule? And what is, you know, what safe withdrawal rate are you comfortable with? Because of my investment management skills and my risk management skills, my safe withdrawal rate is higher than 4%. Wow. That's something. Yeah, you guys just got a little bomb in here that um, that I haven't shared in any other interview. Well, my safe withdrawal rate is higher than 4% because I do have risk management skills and I do have investment management skills in the paper asset class developed over the hedge fund years. Is it an exact number of what it? No, no, there's no exact number. I know it's higher than 4% because I know that 4% is determined by the drawdown periods. And since I have risk management that controls uh, max drawdowns in how I manage my portfolio, I'm not exposed to the same risk level that causes those 4% thresholds. If you think about the 4% rule, it's pretty funny, right? I, I haven't heard too many people talk about it, but you know, 4% rule, the whole premise is you know, an amount of money you can spend from your portfolio that you won't outspend the portfolio in 30 years. Well, 30 years of not making any money on your portfolio results in 3.3%, <laughs> right? So that's just, you never make a dime, you never lose a dime, nothing. You just take the portfolio as a chunk of cash, throw it in a mattress and spend 3.3% a year and you last 30 years. Now, I, I'm playing rough and dirty with the math because I'm not adjusting for inflation. 4% will actually adjust for inflation in there. But you can make a case for it because the research shows that your spending drops roughly 10% in retirement for every decade that you live in retirement. And so you know, that offsets inflation. So, I mean, I can make a case why it's still a legitimate claim. Anyway, 4% is a paltry number I love it. is the, the point I'm trying to make. It's really a, a pretty pathetic number. And as Michael Kitts, who's done a lot of research on this, as well as Wade Fowl points out, um, it, it's a worst case scenario. But what they're also not telling you is that's for U.S. data, which is the most optimistic case scenario. U.S. data is the economic prom queen of the world for the data research, that, for the research that the data is done on or the data that the research is done on. Sorry, fumbled that. And so anyway, you know, there's a lot of issues that go into looking at this, 
But really, once you dig into it deep, you'll see that uh, certain types of investment strategies and ways of constructing portfolios can support a higher safe withdrawal rate. Uh, but again, that's way beyond the scope of this interview. But it, it, it is a reality that exists. Well, we would continue this interview for four plus hours if we could get away with it. But question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Um, I think I would have bought more real estate. And on just a buy and hold basis, you know, like apartment buildings and stuff, you know, I spent years renting apartments and renting houses. And I, I think my younger self, if I could go back, I would beg, borrow, whatever to get that down payment. And I'd buy that first fourplex. And then I would live in it and learn all the ropes of being a landlord by living in one of the four units and dealing with my tenants and figuring out what are good tenants, what are bad tenants learn the ropes, everything, my whole lifestyle would be deductible at that point. I'd start the amortization equation on a, on a fully amortizing fixed rate loan on the property, right? That's a key point of this whole discussion. It's got to be fully amortizing fixed rate loan. Um, start the amortization equation. And as soon as I got that thing cash flowing, as soon as I got it working based on four units of rental, I'd go out and get another one. By the time you get three of those, you're done. You're done. It's like the simplest, easiest way to achieve financial independence for somebody in their 20s. It's it's like such a no-brainer plan. Wow. So I, th- I think in hindsight, I probably would have done that. I just didn't know enough back then. You got to understand, I was committed to financial independence, but I didn't know what I'm teaching you guys now. I mean, I've only learned this through the school of hard knocks and making all the mistakes and doing all the stupid things. And so I didn't understand the real estate asset class fully. I didn't understand buy and hold fully. I started out in the rocket science of investing and I was really enamored with really extraordinary returns in the paper asset class. You know, I since learned to balance it out and to recognize that all these asset classes classes work. They have different characteristics. You know, there's a way to put this together. I, it's taken me a while to figure it out. Todd, I'm curious if you had taken that advice for your younger self and, and invested in these rental real estate properties, would do you think based on your risk management that you've talked about throughout the episode that you would have sold in 2005, 2006? No, because they would have been free and clear. And okay. so there, would, there wouldn't have been a financial leverage component to be concerned about. So they would just be cash flowing. And if you owned your property free and clear at the time, you were still cash flowing through that, through that downturn. The point of looking out for a deflationary collapse is the, is the financial leverage involved in mortgage financing. Because as I pointed out, uh, mortgage uh, financial leverage cuts both ways. So like where that applies to me is I was leveraged up with a bunch of apartment buildings. And so you know, that can destroy my wealth that I created, right? And I don't want to carry that risk. Um, so I did it for a risk management perspective to, to basically take a knee. It's the equivalent of like in football, right? The, you know, they, they kick the ball and the guy calls for a fair catch, right? Because he's got like these, you know, 300 pound guys that can run a a 40 in four seconds or whatever. They're bearing down on him. They're going to slaughter him because they got hang time on the ball. Right? So he calls for a fair catch to conserve and not get slaughtered and not get the ball knocked out of him. And it's the same thing here, right? I kind of called for a fair catch and said, enough is enough. I don't need financial leverage in the face of a credit deflation. That makes perfect sense. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I was curious when you were going through earlier about selling those apartments, like if they were a business in and of themselves that were presumably producing cash flow, positive net income, I was curious why you sold them. But I guess I'm not familiar enough with the financing of real estate of that sort. So you would not have been able to weather, weather that storm. Is that, is that the issue or was it just purely risk management based on not wanting to deal with it? Yeah, it's risk management saying, I don't want to carry that risk. It doesn't, it's, it's not a favorable risk reward ratio. If people are offering to pay me twice what I think a building's worth, why would I carry that risk? Why wouldn't I just harvest the equity and move on? Yep. And again, you got to understand I had no, I mean, I felt that we were going to have some sort of real estate decline. I felt that we were in a credit bubble, which in hindsight turned out to be right. If you had interviewed me at the time, would I have predicted that we were going to go through a 50% decline or more in California real estate prices? No. You know, I don't have a crystal ball here, right? What I did know was that it had gone about as far as it could go. Like I just couldn't see how it could go much further. You know, I had C-class properties when they were mining my tenants and giving them 30-year fixed rate mortgages at like 300 grand. I mean, this one guy that left me was the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, he shouldn't have even had an apartment from me. He got a $300,000 mortgage on a house down the street from my building. And I was like, really? Like that was impossible. You know, and it dawned on me that, that anybody who could fog a mirror 
could get a loan at that point on almost any dollar amount. It was just, you know, they called them liar loans back then. And I was like, what's left? I mean, ultimately all prices are determined by supply and demand. There's no violating that rule. If this guy's part of demand, where's it going to come from after he's done? You know, at some point it has to tilt and prices have to decline. Now, did I have a crystal ball and know that we were going to have this epic real estate decline? Did I know that the banking system was almost going to go to the point of collapse, that ING was going to go under, Merrill Lynch was going to vanish? All these things were going to happen as the credit bubble came unwound? No. You know, it's just like if you – like right now, the, the same questions would be fair, right? We're sitting in front of clearly some sort of problem here. Do I know how it's going to come unwound? No. I just know that we're sitting in front of a problem because risk reward makes no sense. Bonds make absolutely no sense right now as they approach 0% interest rate. 0% is a logical floor and bonds approach it. There's no mathematical upside to bonds. I wrote about it. You can link to a post in the show notes so people can find it. It's called the bomb bubble is here. What to do next? I wrote about that a couple years ago. And I pointed out, I have no forecast for the future. This could go on for a while. I said best case scenario is they kick the can down the road and this thing just goes sideways. But there is no mathematical upside to owing bonds. In combination with inflation, they make zero mass sense. It makes sense to leave the asset class on a risk-reward basis. So I did, right? And that's proven absolutely correct. I left that article intact and dated so people can see it. I haven't changed any words in it. And so I did the same thing with stocks. You know, as the as the internet bubble took place, I was like, this makes no mass sense. You know, I don't know where the final top is. I don't know how it's going to come unwound. So right now you can look at it and go, stock valuations make no mass sense. The current volatility that's in the market makes no mass sense from a historical perspective. Bonds make no mass sense. Real estate, I can't find real estate to make mass sense. Okay, this is a bubble created by artificially low interest rates, the lowest in recorded history. Do I say it's going to come unwound this year? I have no crystal ball. I don't know. I just know on a risk reward basis, I want to remain liquid and I want to remain nimble. That I'm willing to stake my reputation on. In terms of where this goes and how it comes unwound, I don't know. I just know it will. There's a principle in investing I teach, right? One of There's several, but one of them is called mean reversion. What I'm pointing out is this will mean revert. With absolute certainty, it will mean revert. We just don't know how far and how it'll develop. Todd, with you trying to stay liquid, if you don't mind saying, what percent roughly of your net worth is in cash cash equivalents right now? Uh, So it's a definition of liquidity. The paper assets, you can go to cash with the click of a mouse at my size, right? We're not talking CalPERS or Fidelity Management or something big where they're going to move the market. At my wealth, I'm a nobody. And so I can I can go liquid at the, at the click of a mouse. When I talk liquid, I'm talking about an asset class that I can convert, that I can convert to cash. And so my investment exposure varies regularly. My point is I'm in liquid assets, which I count, I count all paper assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs as liquid assets. Wonderful. But yeah, thank you for the clarification. That's very, well, very and the same And the same thing with my business. My business carries no risk exposure either because it's 100% equity. I own it outright. There's no debt on it. And you know the margin on everything that's sold is not quite 100%, but not that far from it. And so there's almost no way for me to lose money on the business. And so- that that's another example of managing risk. I'm just I'm just in a very much risk management mode right now. I, but I always am. I'm always looking for that risk. I'm always looking for that way uh, to get hurt. But you can see how I'm structured. That I'm, you know, where I'm at. Todd, this is incredible. We clearly can just keep going down different paths for hours. I'm sure if you're willing to come back on, I can guarantee you when this goes live that we're going to have feedback from the audience and they're going to have very specific pointed questions. And we'd love to have you on with almost like a AMA type scenario of, you know, let's just talk about the questions and things that Jonathan and I didn't pursue. And if you're open for that, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, sure. Happy to come back. It's a great conversation. I enjoyed talking to you guys. We can deep dive into, you know, in more narrow subjects. We, you know, we broad scoped FI here, right? And so we can go deep dive on narrow subjects that people want to hear about, whatever. I'm cool with it. It's, you know, I'm totally FI. I mean, I am like hardcore. I'm just not traditional FI. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. I mean, it's easy to see that there are many things about the traditional way that FI is explained that you disagree with. But I think it would be silly to say that you're not a part of the FI community. Of course you are. You just chose a different path. Well, again, just thanks so much for just being willing to come on the show. This has just been a real treat. 
Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. And to our audience, this was probably the most controversial episode that we have done, but it's also maybe one of the most important. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking about it some more on the Friday Roundup. So thanks for listening and thanks for being a part of the community. If you want to support us, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P as in Paul, C as in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of FI, and right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of FI. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.